Hello everyone, my name is Jen Nolan and on behalf of Musculoskeletal Australia, I'd like to warmly welcome you to our webinar this evening on understanding complex regional pain syndrome. I'd like to begin, however, by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land from which we are broadcasting, the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and, and emerging. Musculoskeletal Australia wishes to sincerely thank Peninsula Hot Springs for their sponsorship of this evening's webinar, which has enabled us, us to offer it free of charge. It is important to state, however, that our sponsor has had no editorial con control over the content of tonight's webinar. Tonight's webinar is the fourth in our 2023 series. We have three webinars remaining for the year, covering the conditions of osteoarthritis and neck pain, as well as the topic of medicinal cannabis. If you haven't registered for these individual webinars or for the series, you can still do so via our website. If you haven't previously viewed Musculoskeletal Australia's website, I suggest you do so. We have our online shop, as well as a wide range of information, videos, recordings of our previous webinars, tools and services, including our National Arthritis and Back Pain Plus helpline that is available via email and phone on 1800 263 265. Our presenter for this evening is Dr Anne Daly. Anne is a specialist pain physiotherapist with many years of experience working with people with persistent pain through predominantly the public health system, but more recently private health. She has clinical lead roles at both WorkSafe Victoria and the Victorian Transport Accident Commission. And for the past three years, Anne has lectured to physiotherapists undertaking master's degrees in musculoskeletal and sports physiotherapy on the clinical applications of pain sciences. Anne's passion is working with a person with pain to regain control over their ability to undertake activities that are of value to them as an individual and empowering them to ask questions about the value of their healthcare they are receiving. We are extremely grateful to Anne for presenting tonight's webinar. And without further ado, I'll hand proceedings over to her. Thanks very much, Anne. Thanks very much for that warm welcome, Jen. And thank you to everybody who's tuned in tonight. Um, it's, it's a great effort on a, a winter's night like tonight. So let's make a start on this uh, talk on CRPS because I'm sort of well known for packing a lot of information into my presentations um, and I'm glad that it'll be available for you afterwards to um, review or refresh anything that I'm talking about. So my disclosures, as Jen said, are that I'm the clinical lead at WorkSafe for Pain and Disability and for Allied Health at the Transport Accident Commission. And what I've um, put together for you tonight is to start off talking a little bit about what we know around the mechanisms that are predominant when somebody has CRPS and some of the hypotheses as well. There's a lot that we don't know about CRPS. And so uh, this is a sort of an ongoing evolution in terms of our knowledge and our understanding. I'm going to talk a little bit about subtyping or subsets of different types of CRPS. And I'm going to keep giving you little summaries as we go along. Then we're going to talk about diagnosis and management. This is the diagnosis of CRPS is a complex area and it's something that's uh, really worth paying a lot of attention to. <clears throat> and towards the end, in the last part of the webinar, I'm going to be talking to you about the sort of questions that you should ask your clinicians and how you can best find a clinician that understands CRPS because I'm sure that many of you have had experiences where you're seeing people who, who just don't see it that often or who have misunderstandings around that. And then hopefully that'll leave time as well for you to ask questions of me. So before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I'm living and working on today. And for me, that's the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. And I'd like to thank them for the care that they've taken of our lands and seas over tens of thousands of years and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and ex extend that respect to all Aboriginal peoples here today.
So sorry about this slide, but um, there's a reason why it needs to look this complex. And when we're thinking about the type of mechanisms that lie behind a condition like complex regional pain syndrome, what we've come to understand is that it's not uh, it's not one thing that's happening um, in a person when they de develop CRPS. So generally speaking, CRPS will come on after some sort of peripheral limb trauma. So usually something that's happened to the hand or the foot, sometimes the knee, the elbow, um, but mostly those, those uh, what we call the peripheral joints, the, what those ones furthest away from the trunk. And there's different things that can be going on. And these vary from person to person and also over time in the same person. So the most important things to take out of this diagram are that what we know is that there tends to be this exaggerated inflammatory response going on. And this doesn't really make sense in terms of what we expect from inflammation. Usually we would think that inflammation will improve if we take an anti-inflammatory medication, but in CRPS that often doesn't help very much. And then the next part is that we know that there's this ongoing unresolved nociception, which means basically um, uh, messages coming from the foot or the hand up to the spinal cord that are the sort of the preliminary markers of a pain response. And also we wonder if there is some sort of damage to nerves out in the periphery in the hand or the foot. Now, these things can then trigger a whole lot of other re reactions, um, chain reactions that cause some of the really unusual, <clears throat> pardon me, signs and symptoms of CRPS. But what we end up with is things like a loss of functioning in that limb potentially some, some changes in um, the topography and geography in the brain, and in particular the parts of the brain that are paying attention to the limb that has the CRPS, and also potentially some changes within the spinal cord um, that can um, have an impact on things such as muscle spasm, muscle tension, muscle weakness. So all of this can build together where we find that we've got some problems in the sensation, the transition of sensations from the hand or the foot, the limb. And people can also sometimes respond, res re um, can often say that they're uh, having some problems with, in terms of the perception of their limb, that their, their hand or their foot might seem um, bigger or smaller. Um, it doesn't feel quite part of them anymore. And Part of this is linked in with what we call this sort of neglect-like phenomena. So uh, neglect typically comes from the area of stroke where sometimes after a stroke, a person may not actually recognise a part of their body as belonging to them. The neglect we see in CRPS is a little bit different to that. But for some people, it's um, it, it results in the inability to really pay attention to that limb and whether that's an uh, a way of getting away from the really horrible pain of CRPS or there's something going on if the brain's actually telling us to move away, look away from that side. And, of course, there's the motor symptoms that I was talking about just before. So that might actually sound like a bit of a, and you might be screaming at this point in time um, with me uh, going over such a complex diagram, but if you can um, have a look at that later, I think you'll find that there's some really important things to take note of there. So when we think about the type of hypotheses or, you know, um, hypothesis really meaning the sort of things we're thinking might be going on, we can think about CRPS in its acute form in those early weeks or months after it cut its onset, but also down the track at, you know, 12, 18 months plus. And we think that perhaps during the acute part of CRPS, there's some sort of neuroimmune activation going on in the body. and Often with um, when people develop CRPS, you go, well, why did that person get it and someone else didn't? And we have a theory that perhaps something's happening in that person's immune system at, at the time where they just happen to have some sort of musculoskeletal trauma, some sort of injury, and those two things collide. And because they've happened at the same time, that leads to the development of CRPS. Because most people who have CRPS will have had um, 
many injuries in the past that haven't resulted in such uh, a condition, but perhaps something else is happening at the same time or just before, and there's this this you know really unfortunate cl clinician uh, collision. <clears throat> So what we know with new, in terms of neuroinflammation, that there can be um, an unusual type of pain, which some uh, researchers are, are talking about as autoantibody pain. So something's happening in the immune system. And I think our knowledge around the immune system and pain is actually really just at its beginning. But the more I read and the more I learn, the more I know that I think there's something really important going on here. And we know that these changes, this sort of neuroinflammatory response is really specific for CRPS. So when you look at it, these, the, you know, the markers for this in conditions like other forms of neuropathic pain or fibromyalgia, it's not the same. CRPS has its own little um, set of findings that don't really correlate with much else. And then when we're thinking about chronic CRPS, or persistent CRPS, then we're wondering again, what's going on here? Is it just that it's a continuation of what happened in the acute stages, or has there actually been an evolution? And so here may there could be that there are changes, neuroplastic changes, which really mean just changes in the functioning of our nervous system, our central nervous system, in particular brain and spinal cord. Is there some sort of this neuroinflammation sort of just coasting along, which is causing uh, nerves and structures in the periphery to become sensitized and to start to react to all sorts of stimuli at a much lower level of stimulation? Or is this, this uh, neuroimmune situation, is that contributing to the sensitization? And I guess the truth is that it's probably all or some of the above. <clears throat> And so, again, I'm hoping you're not looking like this poor dog at this moment in time and going, my God, what is this woman talking about? I want to really bring you back to what does this mean? And the meaning really is that the mechanisms underlying the signs and symptoms of CRPS really vary between individuals and vary within an individual over time. And so this ends up meaning that there's not just one hypothesis that's going to explain all of CRPS. There's not one answer. And that also means there's not going to be one treatment that works for everybody. And so it can also be that treatments might work now in the acute stage, but down the track they might not work at all or vice versa. And so it's like there's sort of this, this floating, changing a treatment target that we need to hit in order to make a difference with people who have CRPS. So it's complex. And so this is this is always going to mean that not all treatments are going to work for everyone. There's going to be things that work particularly well for some and not for others, and something might start working well but, but really run out of oomph. And this could be because these mechanisms that are behind CRPS actually change and meld over time. So just going on to the idea around subtypes. Uh, so, yes, yeah, sorry, there's just the, um, the the questions and chats just coming up on my screen from time to time. Um, so just talking about subtypes, um, we're not quite sure really if those original uh, CRPS subtypes that, that um, were part of the original diagnosis are as clear and as certain as possible. So some people with CRPS will be told that they have CRPS type 1 and that this is a type of CRPS where there is no nerve damage. However, we know that while we can't diagnose any nerve damage just doing our clinical observation, when you look at it in a research sense, often there is some changes happening with little nerve fibres. And type 2 CRPS is talking about when there tends to be much more of an overt nerve injury occurring. There's also a, what's called um, uh, not otherwise specified. And there are some people who don't quite meet all of the diagnostic criteria for CRPS, but we can't really come up with a diagnosis that better explains their clinical features. And more recently, there is now a new um, classification, which is CRPS with remission of some features, because people have uh, often 
uh, clearly had CRPS in the past, but some of the signs and symptoms as I'm talking about these mechanisms changing over time. So some things might drop away and a person may not meet the criteria for CRPS anymore, but it can be clear that they did in the past. So in terms of subtypes of CRPS, um, we used to talk about there being these sequential stages of CRPS or, or particularly when it used to be called reflex sympathetic dystrophy, where people would move from this stage to the next stage to another stage. But we know now that that isn't actually what happens. In terms of sort of trying to classify CRPS, it's best to think about it as sort of acute and persistent, but also that the two types of um, CRPS are one that's really dominant with cold, with a cold, blue, dry limb that tends to be less swollen um, and then also a warm, red, sweaty, swollen limb. And it's the warm CRPS that tends to be more predominant, but you certainly see uh, quite a bit of cold CRPS as well. So here I want to just, just um, recap and give you that little bit of a summary of the type of mechanisms that we think is going on with CRPS. And it, and I'm going to come back to this later when we talk about treatment because treatment really needs to meet those mechanisms and that's where it becomes complicated because we know that CRPS goes from being something that's probably more peripherally driven, so um, out in the tissues of the hand or um, the foot or, you know, the limb, and then over time the central nervous system becomes more involved in it. So... Here, this is really just summarising some of what's been in the previous slides, that the trauma causes some sort of inflammation, and this is, um, this is related to activation within our immune systems. And this has an effect on connective tissue, so our muscles and our ligaments, and sometimes um, the rate in which our bone cells replace themselves. So there's all of these chemicals being released, and this creates this, what, what I would refer to as this sort of pain sensitizing soup around the area of the injury and this leads to the little nerve fibers that are out there in the periphery becoming very very sensitive to stimulation that that then gets um, carried up to the brain as what we call nociception or what's interpreted at the, at the brain level as pain so all of these things are going on and it's and a lot of this is really driven out in the periphery in the limbs and then as, as time goes on, we know, and this is really the case for, um, for all persistent pain conditions, that the central nervous system comes into play much more as time goes on. And whether this is an adaptive response that we have, uh, wh whether it's a useful adaptive response or not is another thing. But what the researchers have been able to, to show is that there's some changes in the way the spinal cord and brain um, are looking and acting and that causes um, other problems, other sensory issues and, and perception of sensations that are coming from our limbs. For some people, there'll be disturbances within their sympathetic nervous system and this is where um, the sweating, the hair changes, the nail bed changes, those sorts of things um, can really become um, uh, quite significant. And not surprisingly, and again, it's similar to all other chronic pain states, that people can develop mood issues because this isn't very much fun having CRPS, as many of you are going to know. And it's and the, the future is uncertain. And so anxiety and depression are not uncommon. And in fact, to me, they're often a very reasonable response to a not very nice situation. But part of um, something that I, I really want to say to you about this is that some of the chemicals in our bodies that and our brains that are involved with anxiety and depression are also the chemicals that are involved with our pain system. And if um, if you're ignoring the mood side of things and and you're really reluctant to try mood-related medication or other psychotherapies for mood, then you might actually be under-treating your pain as well because they're just so closely linked. So I'm sorry if this slide isn't particularly clear, um, but these are the diagnostic criteria that we use to diagnose CRPS. And these, these 
I, I, I have to say it's really important that people use these when they're making the diagnosis. And in, in reality, often it's a pain medicine specialist who needs uh, to make that diagnosis. Some other specialists and, and pain physios uh, are very good at doing this, but sometimes it's really tricky and you can need a pain medicine specialist's opinion. So the first part of this diagnostic criteria is that the pain needs to not make sense with what's happened to you in with your injury. So the pain is out of proportion and it's often a really weird, unpleasant form of pain. And then we have these symptom and sign categories and people need to be fulfilling components out of these different categories. And so um, some of them are symptoms. So uh, if you came along to see me, I'd be asking you about these different symptoms. And then I would be looking up for signs, for physical signs that are occurring as well. So we talk about these in four different groups. So the first is around sensory um, signs and symptoms. And this is really related to pain. So there's often a, a really um, amplified response to stimulation that we might consider painful anyway. So for example, I might have a toothpick and I'm just um, indenting your skin with that. And um, in your area where you have CRPS, that might be you know, intensely painful, but everywhere else on your body that feels fine. Sometimes just light touch from a, from a brush or a tissue can also be perceived as being really painful. And there's mechanisms be, 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 around, behind why that happens. It's not that you, know, um, you have a low tolerance or low threshold for pain or anything like that. There's actually changes going on in the periphery that cause that sensitivity. The vasomotor changes um, are, are related to differences in temperature between um, one limb and the other, colour changes in the skin, um, colour changes that are different on one hand compared or foot compared to the other. And then when we talk about the pseudomotor or oedema, it, that's talking about swelling, sweating, um, differences in not just having sweaty hands or feet, but one of them, the CRPS side, having uh, a, a much different um, res uh, response with, with sweating. And then for the motor and trophic changes, we're looking at, you know, decreased range of motion, weakness, sometimes a tremor or a dystonia, uh, which is like a, a not very pleasant sort of cramping or spasm feeling. And then uh, trophic changes, so changes in the skin and the hair and the nails, where they become sort of maybe nails often become thicker but more brittle. Skin can become a bit thinner. And um, lots of people will have had that CRPS thing where you get where dark, thick hair comes on your limb. And the fourth part, and this is a really important component of, of diagnosing CRPS, we have to be as certain as we possibly can that there's nothing else that better explains the signs and symptoms because this is a diagnosis that is overused. And there are people who are diagnosed with CRPS who really don't have it. They have other conditions. And the importance of that is that sometimes there's a better treatment pathway for a condition other than CRPS. And so it's good to seek that out when it's, when it's possible. So there was a, a study, um, I was in Japan in 2016 at a study day on CRPS um, and that um, uh, there was a presenter there from France and she was saying in her clinic, when people came in to get a second opinion on CRPS, they were only able to confirm that diagnosis for one in four people. And so three in four people that came into that clinic had other conditions, but they didn't actually have CRPS. And it's not uncommon for people who have unusual limb pain to be diagnosed with CRPS when nobody else knows what to call it. Um, and that's certainly something in my public health practice at the Austin, I would say that probably 50% of people that came in for a second opinion, we did not think that they had CRPS. So that's why I say it's really important to make sure the diagnosis is right for you. And there can be other conditions, of course. So sometimes it's another form of neuropathic pain, but not CRPS. And that, again, that's something that's not uncommon that um, some um, neuropathic pain in hands and limbs gets diagnosed as CRPS just because it's out there in, in, the, in the periphery. So just thinking about the sort of things that 
may um, look like CRPS. Probably the biggest one that I would see is disuse. When a person, because of pain or injury, has actually not been able to use their limb, and over time, the, the, the less the limb gets used, the more it starts to look like CRPS. So swelling and various other um, things are happening there, and uh, that can become um, you know, an issue. It's certainly something I've seen quite a lot. There's some other things where nerves are being um, trapped, um, potentially something, you know, within um, circulation, lymphedema, even an infection can look like a hot, um, sweaty CRPS. But most of these are down to um, uh, early on in the in the progression of the, of the CRPS that you would see this. And there's a number of people who have a functional neurological disorder who get misdiagnosed with CRPS. So I often get asked, does CRPS spread to other limbs? And the answer to this is rarely. It rarely spreads to another limb. And that doesn't mean that people don't get pain in their other limbs, but that can occur for a variety of reasons. So in order to say somebody has CRPS in another limb, they have to meet all of those diagnostic criteria in that other limb. But most of the time when I see people with pain in two limbs, when I actually have a look at it, one of those limbs won't fit the criteria for CRPS. But we know when you've got a limb that's not working very well, there can be lots of secondary um, impacts on the other limb. And so that can result in pain and other bits and pieces going on. And I think that, you know, for people who feel that that they might have CRPS in both limbs, it's really important to get a good pain medicine um, specialist diagnosis there because you may have another condition. And I've certainly seen, um, it, not all that long ago, I saw a lady who's um, who had um, issues in the, the veins in her legs and uh, uh, she lived in the country and getting the diagnosis was actually really complicated. She looked like she had CRPS, but when they actually worked out that she had these blockages in her veins, most of her problems actually resolved. So she actually ended up with a great resolution um, for something that looked a lot like CRPS. So what sort of things might a pain medicine specialist do with you? So, of course, it's medication, and, and I'm not going to go through the, the, the long list of medications that can be used. It really depends on your symptoms. And going back to those different mechanisms, we need to um, match the medications for those mechanisms. And because a lot of people with CRPS will have more than one of those mechanisms happening, it might mean that you need to be taking several different types of medication. And the downside of that is side effects. And of course, medications that we're using to have an impact on your central nervous system are going to have side effects on your central nervous system. And so that, that's often around feeling like you're um, cognitively just not in the best place, feeling really sedated and sluggish. They're, they're not really very nice medications to take. Sympathetic blocks are still used and in my practice um, in public health at the Austin, we use these a great deal and I, I think that they have a, um, a role to play in a, a particular subgroup of people with CRPS. But when we put them through the lens of evidence-based practice that we use these days, they don't quite um, pass the hurdles that they would need to. We can't really say that we've got strong level one and two evidence uh, to support them. But I think there's definitely a subgroup of people for whom sympathetic blocks can be helpful as part of the, the treatment. Again, because of those multiple mechanisms that can be occurring, it's often that there's not going to be one treatment. There's not one pill, injection, surgery, treatment that's going to get you over the line, unfortunately, but that's what that's the fact. Oops. And then, of course, there's spinal cord stimulation. Now, the evidence, again, around spinal cord stimulation and CRPS is not overly convincing. However, I've, I've, I'd have to say I've seen a number of people with CRPS who've had spinal cord stimulation and it, the response is variable from nothing to it's quite useful. 
But perhaps, again, what we need to do is to think that there's subgroups of people with CRPS that perhaps have a really big neuropathic pain component as well um, that may, may actually benefit from spinal cord stimulation. This is a very expensive intervention. It's at least $50,000 and it can be up to $100,000. And we know that there's a very large percentage of people who have complications after spinal cord stimulation um, and will require further surgery. And the best numbers we have on that is it can be 25 to 50% of people that will require further surgery. And a, a fair number of people ask for it to be removed over a period of time. Oops. So I just want to talk a little bit about um, how um, a, somebody like myself, a physiotherapist, would work with somebody with CRPS. And thinking about, and, and when I worked in public health, I saw a lot of acute CRPS because you see a lot of trauma in public hospitals. And here what we would do is we would have, um, our focus would be around these, these three areas. The first was pain reduction. We need, in order to start a person on a rehabilitation pathway, we had to get in control of their pain. And that can be really tricky with CRPS. And that's where working in a multidisciplinary team with pain medicine specialists and rehab specialists, physio, psychologists, the works, we could uh, have our best um, shot at doing that and then reducing edema. So if somebody's got a lot of swelling, it's really hard for a limb to move with all of that swelling happening there. So again, we would work really hard on reducing the swelling. And then for some people, and this sounds a bit extreme, fear reduction, but when you've got, a, when you've got horrible pain going on and you're not getting really clear answers about what, what's happening for you and what the plan is going to be, what the outcome's going to be, it's pretty normal to feel fearful, anxious and worried. But what happens with fear is that an anxiety and worry, it stimulates your, your sympathetic nervous system and the chemicals associated with that stimulation can, can make the, the, the signs and symptoms of CRPS worse. So we have to provide lots of education um, and just start on a really easy pathway into gradually um, becoming more active um, and doing things which seem a bit difficult in the first place, but slowly getting there with support in a team. And then down the track, and now in, in my private practice, I, I pretty much only see people who've had CRPS for quite a while. And these are the sort of steps that I think about when I'm working with them. Um, and the first one really is around engagement. And I've seen a lot of people who've had really unpleasant um, experiences seeing physios, hand therapists, various people with CRPS. And so to me, the most important thing I need to do is to make that person feel safe when they're with me and to let them know I'm never going to touch them without their permission and they'll know what I'm going to be doing <clears throat> because for people who have really severe CRPS, really severe allodynia where light touch becomes really painful, the things that physios and, and hand therapists, for example, do can be really painful. And so the touching component of the treatment needs to be only what's required and a little bit test what the response to that is and then take it from there. And again, lots of education, lots of information, uh, giving people good places to go and have a look online to keep them away from some of the basically crazy information that's um, available on Dr. Google and collaboration on management. So really working, working in, in collaboration with my patients, I'm, at, I'm there for them not to do what I think should be done. We need to work together on this. So then my next stage is around activating them and getting them moving. And we know that this idea around graded exposure, so slowly introducing more difficult tasks, but taking into consideration the amount of fear or, or worry that brings up for the person so that we're not just playing into this big sympathetic nervous system storm. And the person that I'm working with feels like they can cope with the, the little bits that we're doing each time. There's another program called um, PEPT uh, that's been done, and you can look this up. Um, it's open access journal, so you can read it yourself. Uh, this is where they they basically it's uh, from um, 
Scandinavia, and they pretty much made just the the process was they made people do things way beyond their their pain limit. Um, I'm not a I'm not a fan of it um, myself. I I I just I don't think I could do it with a patient. Um, and despite the fact it came out in 2016 with a little bit of evidence that was fairly you know, looking like there was some good outcomes. Uh, I haven't heard much about it since then. And of course, graded motor imagery um, from uh, Lorimer Mosley's group and Noi group. Again, this uh, this is a technique that will work with some people, but not all people. It Again, it's going back to those different mechanisms that are going on for a person. If you're having problems with sensory integration and really feeling like you're in touch with your with your limb, then um, graded motor imagery might be useful for you. Now, I'm a big fan of immersion. I'm a, that means going into a pool. And the reason why I'm a big fan for immersion is, first of all, it can have a fabulous effect on um, edema. Because of the pressure of the water, we can remove a lot of that edema and get limbs moving after they've been immersed in water for about 20 minutes. Now, some people with severe CRPS do find getting into the water very unpleasant, but often once they're in the water and it's at a nice temperature, and here I'm thinking 34 degrees, um, that that can be um, a nice way to get going. What's not so nice is if the water is washing over the part, so it's better for it to be immersed than to be sort of bobbing up and down out of the water. So the next thing really is thinking about what, what does my patient want to get back to? What's the most important things for them? And for a lot of people, that's going to be work. For some people, it's about family. Um, for some people, it's about, you know, can I get back to golf? Can I get back to running? Um, all the sorts of things that they 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 value in their life and that define them as a person, they're the sort of things that I'd be working on with a person. And then also really thinking about the practicalities of um, when the limb is improved to as much as we think it's going to improve, then the reality is what do we need to do? Do we need to make some adjustments with your, with the car? Um, are, there, are there things that we need to do in the workplace? What can we do so that the limb can be as functional as possible um, and not be just um, incredibly painful and, and being totally um, disused, if at all possible. So at the end of this, I always say to my patients, the best thing I can do for you is to help you to stop being a patient, to be a, com a community member and to stop having to have treatments all over the place and, and you know, have your life and your finances tied down um, to to seeing having treatments and particularly treatments if they're not being very successfully um, utilized. So I really work hard um, with my patients on transitioning them to a self management model. Me taking lots of step backs and them doing whatever it is that they can. Me being a backstop for them um, and being there to give them some support and advice, but really allowing them to. To, to just graduate from being a patient and getting back to being a community member. So the summary, the sad summary probably of what I have to say to you about treatment is that at the moment there's no convincing evidence that would make me say I can highly recommend a specific form of physical therapy or rehabilitation or brain retraining for you. There's no evidence out there that makes me go, yep, that's it, I think that's fabulous and um, and, and that's going to help everybody. The thing that does help everybody over the long term is working towards graded exposure and graded activity and being able to be more functional. But there's no other treatments that are necessarily going to help everybody. And again, I keep coming back to that idea that there's different mechanisms and people are dealing with, with a spectrum of conditions, not just one condition. So what does this mean to you? And and I say this, but this is really hard, particularly when you're in a lot of pain and there's all this other stuff going on for you, but you need to be the leader in your management. You need to ask your clinicians what's going on and what's going to happen. And I'm going to give you a bit more on that in a moment. So if we go back to this um, 
uh, uh, diagram that I had before around um, uh, the change in CRPS over time and, and apply it to treatment. When we're talking about it in those early acute stages, we're talking about mostly about what's going on in the periphery. And so our treatment strategies, it's fine for those to be concentrated on doing things in the periphery to, um, to the arm or the leg, the hand or the foot. And the idea is that we start to work on the um, reducing the pain so we can then start to get the limb moving better, weight bearing, doing activities and all of these sorts of things. And if, if progress stalls, then there needs to be more input. It's not going to work to just keep doing more and more of the same thing with no change. And I really like to see within six weeks that six weeks of good attention to any particular program, you should be seeing um, progress. So when we talk about the sort of the changes I, uh, in, in terms of persistent CRPS and it becoming more of a central nervous system related issue, then there's other things we need to think about. And that's about really um, people becoming uh, confident to know what it is that they can do despite the CRPS in their limb and also thinking about harm minimization approach. So only taking medications, only doing treatments that are helpful Re, regaining functional um, activity and just general activity, getting back to work in whatever capacity that you can. So here we're really talking more about activity and participation than pain and impairment. So although that remain obviously remains very important, it's about getting your life back and that's really important. So those sort of graded exposure techniques keep running through this period. And I think the next thing is, you know, that if progress isn't being made, then referral to a pain service um, is really important. And if control over the pain is is just so inadequate that the person can't with CRPS can't engage in their rehab, then it needs to be upped. And many of the public hospitals that have pain services will, um, particularly in acute CRPS, they, they will do their best to get somebody with acute CRPS in as soon as they can um, so that they can get people onto the right pathway. I, I don't know how things are right now because I'm no longer working in public health, uh, but we did our best to get people in within a few weeks. So the summary here, the things that I've been sort of saying, I guess, in several different ways, is that these different, that, that CRPS is a clinical syndrome rather than a specific disease. It's not really one thing. There's these different mechanisms and therefore there's different therapeutic requirements for people who are presenting in different ways. And so we have these um, divergent and moving treatment targets, again, which are around pain and inflammation and an impact on function and combinations of these, and they're individual for people. Don't see people coming in with CRPS and it's all the same. So acute CRPS tends to be warm or cold. The cold form is often more severe and some of the treatments that we use don't tend to be as helpful with it as the warm CRPS. Um, when I say the warm type of CRPS seems to be re relatively homogeneous, there's more similarities between people with that warm CRPS. So when we see persistent CRPS, there's so many different presentations. Again, it's not just one, one presentation. And even in the, in the situation of persistent CRPS really requires this this careful ongoing assessment that you get reassessed over time and examined to see what's happening with this. And I think part of that is really getting an idea around what the dominant type of mechanism might be for a particular person. So what sort of questions should you ask your clinicians? And I know it can be really hard to feel like you're in charge of that. But what I say to uh, my patients when they're going off to see a specialist is, write the questions down before you go, even hand them to the person um, on a piece of um, paper so that uh, they know you're going to ask the questions and don't wait to the end to say, look, I've got five questions for you now. Say that early on so that they can prepare um, and, and time manage within the appointment appropriately. 
So the first thing I'd be saying to a clinician is, how do you know I have CRPS? What, what's making you say that? And what you want to know is that they've used those Budapest diagnostic criteria. That's essential to really make sure that CRPS is the problem that you have. And then saying, is there anything else that it could be? And as I said before, um, the reason why I'm suggesting this is that it's a really overused diagnosis and sometimes you'll need to see a number of different specialists before you really get to the, to the, um, to the nub of what's going on for you. And the next question would be, so what can you do that will help me? I'm here to, you know, you're here to help me. Um, what will that drug slash intervention, what will, what will that do? What, what's going to happen when I take that medication? And what are the likely side effects? And are they going to go on and on and on? Or will they last for a few days or a week and then taper off? What are the potential risks of undertaking that intervention or using that medication? Um, and, and as part of that, what are the potential risks? What are the most likely risks? Because if you've ever read the information sheet that, that comes with the medication, you know, you could think that it's unlikely that you're going to escape really serious side effects, but they actually write down practically everything that could um, ever happen. So I like to say, so what's the like, what's likely to happen if I take that? And also, what's the likely outcome if I don't go ahead with that? What Am I going to be doing myself a disservice if I don't take that medication or do that intervention? You know, what's the relevance of it? What if I say no? And what can I do that would optimise the drug or the intervention? What should I be doing at that time? And this comes down a lot to, for example, um, having blocks, uh, having blocks and going home and thinking, I don't know if I'm supposed to rest or exercise or whatever. It's really good to know what you should be doing alongside that intervention. How can you value add to what it is that your medical practitioner is doing with you? And I, I really like the website for choosing wisely. And this is a, a you can Google this and, and have a good look at the Australian one. It's a worldwide movement, but it's really about empowering um people who are seeing healthcare clinicians, empowering them to know what sort of questions that they should ask. And remember, it's just, this is your body. This is, this is your condition. You are very welcome to ask these, uh, ask any questions that you have. There can be time limitations. And that's why I say it's really good to set that up with the person um, in the first place. So the, the next thing might be, what can I do to help myself? So part of it, it's always this collaboration, this partnership between yourself and your clinicians. And often my, my patients will want to know, is there anything that I shouldn't be doing? Is there anything that could be harmful? And how will I know if I am doing too much? Now, this is a really complex question and I can't answer it for all of you. Uh, my, my sort of go-to is... I'm okay if you're feeling uncomfortable for a couple of hours after we do something or you do your exercise or your intervention. But if you're then in a lot of pain for hours after this and going into the next day, or if that response means that you can't keep your functional level up, then we need to revisit what it is that, that, that we're doing. So a couple of hours of discomfort, I think that's sort of okay. That sounds, I think that sounds really hard for me to say that to people, but that's that's where I'm at. Not hours and hours or days of feeling um, pain, in, increased pain or, or an inability to move. That's That's not helpful. And then if you're going along and you're having this treatment and nothing's happening, then think about asking why. You know, we've been doing this for six weeks or 12 weeks, whatever it is, but I'm not noticing any difference. What are your thoughts on this? What should we be doing differently? So a couple of really good resources for you. Um, to access uh, on these um, web pages. And this, I've chosen these because they've got specific information around CRPS. Just, I'll just give you the heads up that I'm the main author on the Better Health Channel 1 um, so that uh, really <laughs> you'll just be hearing, um, you'll be reading more that I've um, I've written with my colleagues at the Austin. It actually can be quite a good page to print out and give to family members or or 
or work colleagues who really are not going to understand CRPS. Even some clinicians um, don't understand CRPS. So sometimes handing them something that's like a really good information sheet about CRPS is a good thing. And then how do you find somebody who's an expert in CRPS? And so here's my, um, my three choices for you. If you want to find a, um, a, what, what we call now a specialist pain medicine physician, uh, you can go to the website of the Faculty of Pain Medicine and they are listed there. Now, under the Australian Pain Society, they've got a listing of all of um, people who have um, put themselves up as, as being um, experts in pain. And you'll also find the public pain services on there. So um, clearly trying to have this treated through the, the private through private health system is pretty expensive undertaking. And the, we have fabulous um, public pain services um, in Australia. And, um, and particularly uh, related to CRPS. So feel free to have a look on those. You can also go onto the Australian Physiotherapy Association and on that um, website called Choose Physio, you can go into something called Find a Physio. And what you need to do is just navigate yourself down to this area um, that says Refine Your Search, click on Titled or Specialist Physiotherapists, and then go down and select uh, Pain. And so this is what we call um, titled uh, pain physios or specialist pain physios. And titled pain physios have done very significant amounts of continuing education and experience around complex pain conditions. And there's only a few of us specialist pain physios um, at the moment, but there will be more in the next few years. And we've gone through um, a, another process on top of that. Um, so that's how you can find somebody who has that. That's your best chance of finding somebody who has good knowledge around CRPS. So, look, thank you very much for paying attention um, and very happy to take some questions uh, from the audience now. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Anne. That was a very detailed um, presentation over about a, what is, you know, a very complex condition. No, no doubt about that. Um, just to remind everybody, the recording of this webinar will be sent out to everyone who registered for the webinar and also will be freely available on our website. Probably it'll be on the website from about next week. Um, so, yeah, look, if people will be able to view the recording as many times as they like, because it certainly is quite a, a complex and a large amount of information. There are some questions that have come through. Uh, so we've only got a short time. We've got about six minutes to get through some questions. So Anne, if you could provide just a bit of a brief response to the ones that I'll, I'll pass on to you. Um, just the, the role of diet, uh, could that possibly, you mentioned about an exaggerated inflammatory response um, as a part of the sort of uh, peripheral um, uh, trauma, initial trauma and so on. Could, does diet play a role at all in relation to, to management? We, we don't know. The answer to that is not sure. Um, but like exercise, diet uh, is, is generally, a good diet is generally a good thing. The difference between the, in, so there's a lot of, of talk around inflammation and diet now. The inflammation related to CRPS is slightly different because it's this neuroinflammation. And so uh, we can't be certain that the things that would generally help the you know run of the mill inflammation would necessarily help the inflammation we see with CRPS. I'm not okay. a fan, I'm not a fan of any extreme form of dieting, but what I would usually say is you can try something and see how it goes as long as it's not extreme. And then um, someone's commented about the, how you sort of talked about CRPS usually, usually being in the hands or feet extremities. Uh, this person had a cervical radiofrequency ablation. Um, she's got sort of quite a sort of a um, reaction in her lower neck and neck with regards to tingling, aching, some pain. M might it be CRPS? It's unlikely to be CRPS. Uh, CRPS um, doesn't really happen in the trunk. It doesn't really happen in the spinal areas. There's some discussion about whether it can happen in the face. Um, it's more likely that it, it could be a, um, uh, a neuropathic pain condition related to that. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, someone was told um, to take uh, vitamin C daily post-surgery uh, to re reduce the risk of CRPS. Um, is this well known that you've heard of or you haven't mentioned it tonight? Yeah, so um, there was a study a while ago that showed that if you took um, one to two grams of CR, of, it's not of CRPS, of vitamin C, um, around it was a, a study related to people who just fractured their wrists and the group of people who took the vitamin c had less um, occurrence of crps it hasn't been then shown to be um in in different settings that it's necessarily worked however uh, vitamin c is a cheap um a cheap thing to take, uh, almost, uh, you could say it's a very safe thing to be taking as long as you nothing in mega doses, okay, that's not a good thing to do. Um, and so, yeah, some uh, one gram a day, which is just the normal dose, is being considered to perhaps be useful. I have to say I took it before I had um, arthroscopies on my knees because I, I, I get a bit paranoid about developing CRPS myself. Um, I didn't get didn't get CRPS, um, but the jury's out as to whether it's helpful. It's probably not costly and it doesn't seem to be harmful. And um, is there any sort of, uh, would, would you class Raynaud's, uh, um, Raynaud's uh, syndrome in fibromyalgia as forms of CRPS? No. So so they're quite different and could have um, quite different um, uh, uh, treatments um, for them. I have seen Raynaud's that looked a lot like CRPS once, um, but you're likely to find better treatment strategies um, for treating Raynaud's at, at, as at, certainly. Fibromyalgia is now also um, being considered to be um, uh, primary widespread pain and to belong to a group of conditions that feature nociplastic pain. This is a fairly new definition. CRPS may, be, well, it is now grouped within this primary um, pain condition. So they're different, uh, but there's a, there's probably some, some more similar similarities we'll find over time. I don't think we've got any evidence that the treatments for CRPS, the very specific ones, necessarily would help fibromyalgia. Mm. And and what what are the long term effects of someone being uh, misdiagnosed in from? Uh, or, or the question is, what are the long term effects from CRPS being misdiagnosed for three years uh, during uh, due to a range of uh, reasons and so on? So the potential or the the, the um, well, the pros and cons mainly are the ones mainly about being misdiagnosed. What what's the uh, potential there? Misdiagnosed as having CRPS or misdiagnosed yes, being, not, yeah, not having CRPS. misdiagnosed for three years. Um, uh, they've all come up with the same diagnosis of CRPS, and finally, this person's being approved for a spinal cord stim stimulator. So. Um, yeah, so they've come up. Uh, so either way, if you're, as you see, you've talked tonight about being misdiagnosed and how you would maybe go along potentially the wrong treatment pathway. If someone is not diagnosed for a long period, uh, what's the scenario there? Yeah. Uh, I mean, that, that it's very hard to say that really in terms of an individual circumstances. So um, it's sometimes when we're treating pain as a primary symptom, sometimes the interventions are very similar no matter what the diagnosis is. Perhaps with CRPS, people might jump to some of the more neuropathic medications early on, um, but uh, it's it's impossible in retrospect to, start to really say whether it's changed uh, the outcome for anybody having a delayed diagnosis. It's certainly, um, yeah, not a great position to be, and it'd be interesting to see how they go with their spinal cord stimulator. Yes, and um, and just one last question because we're nearly out of time. Have you looked at the role of lymph the lymphatic plays in CRPS? Yeah, so if that, I think that question might have been around um, uh, whether lymph drainage might help. There's no evidence that that it will help um, anything more than temporarily. So um, similarly, immersion in water. 
uh, has um, an effect an effect on lymphatic drainage as well. And so what we see is a temporary response, perhaps for a couple of hours. Um, but yeah, I think um, lymphatic drainage, particularly if somebody had allodynia, would be very difficult to tolerate. Mm. Um, so look, we're going to have to finish there. Some people have come in a, a bit sort of belatedly with a few questions and so on, but I'm afraid we're out of time for this evening. Someone has also just sort of asked to, to see the, the slides again with different websites and so on. Um, beyond, um, Anne has actually got a couple of slides at the end uh, where uh, it also um, got quite a few references here and so on. So when you receive the recording, uh, all of that will be available to you. And as I've said, you'll be able to look through the recording as many times as you like. Look, we're just after 8pm, so we will finish there. And look, thank you once again. You're a great supporter of Musculoskeletal Australia. And we're very grateful for that. Um, so I, I hope this has been, of, I'm sure this webinar has been of, of great information and benefit to the people who have viewed it tonight and will view it in the future. So thank you, Anne. Thanks to everyone who joined this evening. Could I ask you to uh, take a moment to complete the exit survey that will come on your screens when we close for this evening? Um, and also, again, thank you to Peninsula Hot Springs for sponsoring tonight's webinar. On that note, everyone have a good evening. Good night. Good night.